of us will check. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, sir. Okay. I was telling Brother Reggie just now, 8.30 Monday morning, that ought to be illegal. <laughs> All right. Monday should not start till after lunch. <laughs> All right. Especially after a full, you know, after a full day in church and, you know, we ought to look forward to having a day in church. You know, it's, it's something that I, th- I, I always look forward to. It's always fun. Uh, you know, it's not just whether or not I'm preaching, but it's always exciting and fun to be with the other brethren, right? To be with the other sheep. And uh, I hope that's your heart also, right? To be uh, not just faithful in the, you know, in the, the assembly of the saints, but that it is fruitful for you and that it is something we all enjoy and it brings us great joy to be together. Okay, okay so let's do this. Um, open our Bibles and we're going to do what we were supposed to do this morning and we will go to Acts chapter 20. All right, Acts chapter 20 and... Um, We're going to read from verse 13, all right, Acts chapter 20, verse 13, all the way down to all right, verse 31, okay, verse 13, all the way to verse 31. So let's all stand our respect for the reading of God's word, all right, we'll do this, uh, so just follow after me, just, uh, we'll read, I will read one verse, you read the next. All right, beginning in verse 13. And we went before to ship and sailed unto Ersos, there intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And we sailed again and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at a Trigolium. And the next day we came to Miletus. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the laying, lying in wait of the Jews. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. All right, let's read the last after verse 32 together. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the grace of which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. All right, may God bless to us the reading of his word. 
Father, we thank you for this evening, for the dinner that we were about, uh, that we were able to have, for the fellowship that we have been able to enjoy. And Lord, I pray and ask right now, even as we come back to your word again, that as we commit this time to the sit under the teaching and preaching of your word, that you will enable us to have spiritual understanding, to be able to see the implications and also the application of your word. And Father, I pray and ask for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, that I will be able to preach with the power and the might of, of the Holy Spirit and not with the might of man. I pray, Lord, you help us to focus on what you have to say rather than on what uh, man has to say. And Lord, I pray that our hearts and minds will be tender. Lord, help us to be responsive also to the preaching of your word. We commit this time to you, take away all distractions. We ask this in Christ's name, pray. Amen. All right, please be seated. Now, I was originally going to start in Acts chapter 20, all right, in this text, because here, once again, Paul calls for a meeting, all right, and he gives his final words. All right, final words, again, these are important things. All right, important words. He, this is an, a point of emphasis as far as the Apostle Paul is concerned. And he wanted them, the elders from Ephesus, to take note. Okay, now I want to, just a very quick thought as we get started is, now some of us may not fully be convinced why we need to be here or to be at a conference like this. Okay, but we need to realize things are important, are not just there so that we can say, yes, amen, this is very important, I shall treasure it. What is important and things that we treasure, it is worth defending, it is worth protecting, it is worth not only just upholding now, especially as a New Testament church, whatever we believe that is important, you know what, it is to be defended, especially in the form of our practice. It's not just something to put on a doctrinal statement all right, or, or in the articles of faith in our official documents. It is something to put into practice. The things that you and I do each day okay, that we do not forget to do are the important things. Let me ask a question. How many of you brush your teeth this morning? <laughs> oh, not many hands. Okay. Uh, uh, right. uh, now, why do you do that? It's important. It's important. That's why you do it. All right? And, but I, so I feel, now this is very simple logic that we use to tell our, even our children. But sometimes I don't, so therefore I don't understand why sometimes that we say, okay, this is important and whatever, but pastor, don't you think that, uh, uh, you shouldn't be preaching about this so much? Okay, but realize this. The things that are important are worth doing. Amen. Right? You protect it not just by in declaring it, but in its, in its practice. It's preserved in its observance. For instance, marriage. It's not just the concept that is important to us. If it's important to us, it will show in how we interact with each other Right? How we operate together as husband and wife. Okay? So it is in the doing that we preserve this, not just in communicating, communicating, writing booklets, and uh, we, we put up all the pre however. It is in the doing, it's in the practice and the observance. Right? Now, that's why when you go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, remember it says to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Notice the next part says teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. What was that observance? It's not to passively look. That observance is in the practice, right, of what? All that teaching. Where is that teaching to occur? In the local New Testament church. It's the saints that are taught. Now, the word teaching is where we get the word doctrine. Doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. Right? But teaching, as you know, many, I speak to many who are teachers, is not in one ear, out the other. 
Right? It's not, well, I learn advanced calculus and then I do it for the exam. After that, I forget all about it. I give it back to my teacher. Okay, I know that's what most students do. But it is that you live this out, you are able to apply it. That is where, when you contend for the faith, it is not just about, uh, it's not just about intellectual ascent, not just in agreeing to the concepts. It is what we live this out in the daily life of our existence as a New Testament church. So when we come to Acts chapter 20, right now again, these are his final words. They, they are traveling. Paul is uh, trying to speed things up by, in verse 16, he's trying to make his way over to Ephesus, right? It says uh, to Jerusalem, actually, he says, look at verse 16, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. All right, day of Pentecost uh, which was, would be 50 days actually from the day uh, from Christ's resurrection. All right, and this is actually uh, an annual festival. Uh, uh, now, uh, here he wanted to get there, but so he decided, okay, he's going to send the messenger over to ask for the pastors in Ephesus to come over to meet with him. All right, we see this in 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. All right, so just by way of introduction here, now he addresses the Ephesian elders, all right? He calls for a pastor's conference in Miletus. And look at verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you in all seasons. Now, I want to see here the care and concern for the churches he started. And that's why he called for the uh, elders to come to meet with him in Miletus. And they traveled over from Ephesus. No need care and concern for the churches. He started care and concern also for the pastors of the church. That's why he called for the elders. All right? These were the men that Paul had trained to be his replacement. You know, every, one of the things about uh, being very mindful that as a pastor, uh, it is our job to train and to prepare for the people who will replace us someday. Okay, beware of a church where the mentality is this, you know what, this church will die with me. This church is not, the church is not to, supposed to be my retirement plan. All right, and if we're not working ourselves out of a job, we're not doing our job right. Okay, that I, my, I have determined from the, actually when I surrendered that my goal would be that I will find people who are better than me. Okay, and when that day comes, I'm tr I've trained those people and that they're better than me, you know what, I will rejoice. Amen. Because why? I can move on to something else. Yeah. The Lord can move me to something else. Now, here, he, these are the men, all right, that they were appointed in the church in Ephesus. Now, they came to him and he testifies to them. He says, ye know. Why? Because it's commonly known about Paul. Right? Ye know. This is from the first day I came into Asia. After what manner I have been with you at all seasons. His conduct as the missionary pastor. That was something open, transparent, known to everyone. They could see it for themselves. And he was pointing out, he says, look, this is my testimony. You've seen me. You know me. You know how I functioned and operated as a pastor. This is what? Serving the Lord with what? All humility of mind. He's not a big shot. He doesn't promote himself to be something. When he introduces himself in the epistles, many times he will describe himself, Paul, what? Servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Right? He says, yeah, I'm an apostle, but first and foremost, I am a servant. And I'm as a servant, God can use me in any way he wants. Any way. I remember the one uh, testimony of, uh, uh, I read about this, the testimony of one deacon who was uh, in prison because uh, he actually, I think it was had shared the gospel and he, he took a stand for something. So he was put in prison. Now the lawyer came to him and you know what? He, he told the lawyer, he says, you know, you see this pencil? That's me. 
God can use me any way He wants. God, if He chooses to break this pencil, so be it. If He chooses to use this to write something with it, so be it. But we are merely an instrument. And here it says, He had served the Lord, not serving Himself, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. All right? And then it says, and with many tears. Because why? That work was not easy. All right, many tears, the, the tears of a pastor are things that most people will not see. Sometimes I think even the pastor's children will not get to see them. Pastor's wife will know this. So with all, with tears, why? Tears sometimes because of the difficulty of the work. Sometimes because with tears we plead with members, with those who have disobeyed the clear counsel of the word and it grieves us. Tears. This is and temptations. Okay? Pastors are not superhuman. There are many temptations that they face. Pride is one of them. You know, uh, the many temptations of the flesh there's always the constant temptation to quit. Every Sunday night, Monday morning. <laughs> okay, discouragement, uh, self-doubt. You know, are we, you know, are we uh, really, should we be doing this? Are we on the right track? You know, whatever. And even when the Lord has placed a very clear conviction about what to do, uh, sometimes these could be there. Now, he's faced all this. It says, which befell me by the lying in way of the Jews. So that explains why he had tears and temptations. Why? Because he was constantly on guard. All right? Because there were the enemies and these Jews were trying to, what? Infiltrate into the New Testament churches that he had started to bring the people under the yoke of bondage, right? to put them under the law of Moses, which cannot, not only cannot save someone, it cannot keep you saved. Okay? The legalists had, were looking for every opportunity and why this was a constant problem for Paul. Okay? And he talked about that, referring to also the thorn in his flesh. It had to do with the fact that wherever he went, they were tracking him and they were following him and they were not far behind. They were always trying to go into the church, a young new church that he has just started. They would not leave him alone. The temptation to quit is great in those cases. Uh, the temptation sometimes is, you know what, why do I bother? Just compromise with them, right? Just let's all get along and then they will stop giving him trouble. Why look for trouble for ourselves? This was there. They were continuing to hound him. But notice, he took heed as to how he conducted the ministry because he, he did not keep him from doing what should be done. Look at the next verse. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He taught them everything. He didn't hold anything back. You see, today we, are, we have departed from this Amen. because now we have, moved, we have shifted to where the pastor is trying to profit materially yeah. from everyone rather than to profit the members of the church. Shame on them. Yeah. All right? He said, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Now, realize this. The heart of the pastor is that he wants to give you the good stuff. Stuff that will build you up, will make you strong, right? To help you in your growth, to, so that it will, your walk with the Lord will be profitable, your service unto the Lord will be profitable. Why? Because He wants all of us to be fruitful, not just Himself. Okay? And so He doesn't hold anything back. He has given to them, right, in His faithful ministry in the Word, everything that could profit the saints. This is called edifying the saints, building them up. Okay, it's different from the modern def redefinition of the word where they, where they say something's edifying is because something I like. If it's not edifying, it's because I don't like that. I was offended. 
No, here it builds them up, right? So whatever was profitable to, unto them, but it says, and I've showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. He did not have any private doctrines. Whatever he taught, it's an open book. Everyone can see for themselves. There are many witnesses. That's why in 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, he says what? And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What happened? Those things, right? He taught everyone could hear. He said, among many witnesses, you can verify. You see what I'm saying here? You can verify. He doesn't say, well, actually privately, here's what I think. All right, um, I know of a, a case where in the church, the members, I think for 15 years, did not know that the pastor was, believes in a certain doctrine. And all those years, I, I had to tell that man, I said, uh, actually, the, the pastors, we knew about this. He said, we weren't aware that he did, wasn't teaching that in, your, in the church that you were in. But you see, Paul did not have any ninja doctrines. Okay, nothing by stealth. It was always open. It was always there uh, among many witnesses. Why? So there is al it's always verifiable. He went, this is from house to house. Why? Because they did not come. They were not able to come into one big hall or church building, wherever, in every home, wherever there was a church gathering, wherever. He went there. He taught them that. All right. He held nothing back. Okay, now the, if you follow the, like the, uh, I grew up watching all the Kung Fu movies in the 70s. Okay, the master, the Chinese Kung Fu master will always hold something back from the disciples. Why? He's afraid that the disciple will become greater than him. So they will not teach everything. I'll teach you all the moves, but there's one secret one which I hold back. Now, Paul was not that way because why? He gave everything to them. What was his goal? So that they could surpass him. Okay, because as the pastor or the, pre let's say, the main preacher in the church, whatever, my job is not to prove to everyone that I'm the best preacher. Because, understand this, this is, you see, the focus <coughs> of the pastor is not to be the most valuable player in the NBA. Why? He's the coach. How do you measure the coach? By the quality of the players he's training. Not by how well he can shoot or dribble or you know and turn the game around. Why? Because he's not the player, he's the coach. His job is to teach, his job is to train. Now you cannot have that if the man of God, the pastor, is an insecure person or a prideful person or he's egotistical. Amen. Why? Because as the coach, it is not about me. Okay? My pride and joy will be the people that I have taught and trained. Right? And the, so the problem, part of this, I, I, if you identify from here, is that unless the mindset of the men who are in ministry and in the, and in the, in the pastorate change the focus will always be on me on the pastor or the man of god being the most valuable player in the whole church rather than producing a multitude training an army of men and women who could surpass him you realize just changing this at a fundamental level will produce a very different kind of quality in our church all right Understand this, that the heart of a pastor, if he, he, he is faithful to the scriptures, you know, I want you guys to be strong. I want you guys to be able to stand on your own. I want the men who we train as preachers, you know, that they're going to be far more effective. That by the time I'm gone, I can go in peace. Amen. Right? Knowing that the church will be in very good hands. Why? Because it is not about my performance. Okay? The problem we create is that in it, when it becomes a man-centered ministry, it is always about the man of God, that pastor, his performance. Instead of 
how effective he is at training others to outperform him. He taught them. He held nothing back. All right, take heed. All right, how we conduct the ministry. Take heed also how to who, how we handle the gospel. Look at verse twenty-one. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. All right, repentance toward God. Notice and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that the case? Because it must begin with a correct message of the gospel as its foundation. Right? Because if we don't get that correct, everything else fails. Okay? Repentance toward God. What is that? Man must turn to God in repentance, turn from depending on our own works of righteousness. Okay? You cannot, there's no way you and I can reform. Okay, we cannot. It's not by our own works of righteousness. Scripture does not contradict Scripture. It's not by our own works of righteousness, but by His what? Mercy, He saved us. All right, I think it's in Titus chapter 2. But here, men must repent. Men must stop depending on their own works of righteousness. Agree with God. That's why it talks about that we should confess our sins. It, uh, confess, uh, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we agree with God how he looks at us. We're wretched without hope. And then, by faith, trusting that what? Christ is the propitiation for our sins. He made full payment, done everything that was necessary for our salvation, and that God promised if we would believe that, that we can be saved. Do you realize that many problems in churches would actually either go away or be minimized very greatly if people were saved if church members were saved if pastors and missionaries were saved first john 5 verse 11 and 12 says and this is the record okay he, he makes it, this is a sworn, declared statement. This is the record that God had given to us eternal life. How is this found? And this life is in His Son. Okay, eternal life is not found in anywhere else, anyone else. It's found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. who was raised from the dead after three days and three nights in the grave. Now, it says, He that had the Son had life. Is Christ dwelling in us? All right? You know because if, if He dwells in us, the Holy Spirit of God also will indwell us. Is He in us? Because He that had the Son had life. What kind of life was it? Eternal life. And He that, but, and he that had not the Son of God had not life. Okay. This is a very simple verse. This is not gymnastics or whatever, but it answers the question why sometimes, you know, in some, with the case of some people, you have to simulate life in them. They have no life of their own. There is no spirituality that comes naturally from the inside. We have to have programs and programs and programs to simulate and to stimulate life in them. When this, and that runs contrary to the scripture because it says, if you have the Son of God in you, there will be evidence of life. It will be there. It will be unmistakable. All right? And this is the starting point because you, without that, you cannot build a church. You cannot have a spiritual church if the church is full of the natural men. All right? So he that had the Son... Now, people like to quote this verse, but they quote the first part. He that had the Son that had life, right? Do you ask Jesus to come into your life? That's a misuse of that verse. Because the second part tells us if you don't have the Son of God, that's because you, you, know, you don't have life in you, it's because you don't have the Son of God in you. All right? Why is someone not growing? That's odd. All living things will grow. If they are sickly, they, their growth may be hindered. 
but they will grow. The only things that don't, don't grow, right? This is made of fabric and plastic or whatever. You come back 20 years later, you look exactly the same. Exactly the same. You will see there will be growth. And where there's growth, you notice with, even with our babies, growth is not perfect. Starts and stops. When they walk, what happens to the little ones? They fall flat on their faces many times. That's exactly what young believers do. There will be marks of imperfection. There will be, but there will be evidence of progress. It's unmistakable. It's there. The mistake, I think, in our culture has been we look for marks of perfection instead of marks of progression. Okay? Some of the people I know today, like for instance, who are serving the Lord and are even preaching today, you know, I know they're far from perfect. There are, there are a lot of rough edges, but you see that they grow. They go to times of discouragement. They fail, and then they keep coming back. They keep coming back, and they keep coming back. But in, the, in our culture today, our church culture today, many times they say, Pastor, we shouldn't help this person. We shouldn't work with this person. We shouldn't support this person. Can I remind everyone, the most perfect-looking church member in the New Testament church, uh, sorry, in the New Testament scriptures, was Judas Iscariot? <gasps> Pastor, what are you saying? It's true. He was, his reputation was so perfect that when the disciples asked, who, Lord, is the one that will betray you? Is this the one that's going to dip his hand into the sauce together with me? He is the one. Judas dipped his hand. He says, is it me? He says, thou say it. You're the one? Everyone looked at him, they look at Jesus, and nah. He left the room. What was on your mind? Oh, it must be he's gone to give money to the poor. Why? Because that was the mask that he had given to everyone all this time. Everyone knew him very well, but they could not see what was inside. Right? Even when it came to washing the feet, or the disciples, what happens? Jesus has said, you know what? All, you're all clean, but not... You know, say you're clean, but... You're completely clean, but not all. Why? One of them was not a disciple. But they trusted him so much, they made him the treasurer. And even when the scriptures tells us he was stealing from the bag... Nobody suspected that at all. Not once. All right? They assume, right, he's gone to give money to the poor. That's why the bag is empty all the time. <laughs> he's got such a good heart. Okay, ladies, I hope you have some tips here, right? Because this same mask can fool you into thinking that you have found the perfect man to marry. Okay, it could be the greatest disappointment. Okay, and, and in our churches today, someone like Judas becomes a great stumbling block. Many people, because of the scandal, imagine if there was a scandal like that, they would leave church. That's why our logic is, if someone like that so impeccable, so unblemished of record and in and, and, and his conduct, however, can fail like that. You know what? There's no hope. You know, I, I'm just going to drop out of church. This, this whole thing is, you know, I give up. Now, Paul makes it very clear that he preaches this. He handles the gospel carefully both to the Jews and to the Greeks. Why? Because it is one gospel. There is one message. There is only one way of salvation. It says both to the Jews and to the Greeks. 
All right, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've, I've met uh, preachers who, who tell me when you look at that verse, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that's because, you see, the Old Testament Jews, whoever this is, you know, that, that's how they get saved. I said, but what about the Greeks? Every word here is important. All right? And, and here, this was one way, but he testified to all of them consistently this message. Now, no need we have to take heed. How do we handle the gospel? Take heed to remain in the will of God. Verse 22 and 23, now, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. You notice something? There was a lot of warnings even before this that there were things that were going to happen to Paul when he arrives in Jerusalem. Trouble was waiting for him. But remember I said, uh, was it yesterday, that knowing and pursuing the will of God for your life is more important than anything else. Amen. Here, he says, he says, look, there is uncertainty. I don't know what was going to happen to me there. Now, what does he know? Verse 23 says, Saving, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. Can you imagine everywhere he went, the witness of the Holy Spirit was clear saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. What's it, what was the Holy Ghost trying to tell him? Paul, you are going to become a prisoner. Bonds and afflictions, you are going to suffer. Over and over again, wherever Paul went, on this journey to Jerusalem, this was the consistent message that was confirmed to him. My question is this, so if you were in his shoes, will you go? Hmm? Now, we have to stay the course even in the face of trouble in the ministry. Verse 24 says, but none of these things moved me. All right, none of these things. All right, every warning about what's going to happen. Now, he's very clear. I need to go. I need to move on. If that is what God has in mind and in store for me, so be it. All right, it says here, none of these things move me. It's not going to change my mind. It's not going to change the direction I'm going to go. All right, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Why? Because that, this life means very little. Because why? I belong to him. All right? He is my master. He can use me any way he wants. That was settled in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. When you present your body a living sacrifice, I have given that up. I have given up all rights to my Lord and my master. You want to know what it means to be a disciple? That's it. I have handed my life to him to do as he will. Here it says, Neither count I my, uh, my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my cause with joy. Now, the joy of finishing that cause e here it meant even if it was death and persecution and being put on trial over and over and over again, as you see in the final years of Paul's life. He was repeatedly put on trial. But he says, You know, I need to finish. The only way I'm going to do this, I have to finish with joy. But you notice this joy comes in spite of the difficult circumstances. This joy does not come from the absence of trouble in our lives. It comes from what? Completing God's will and perfect plan for my life. What happened? Over and over again, now, I think it was in the earlier uh, chapters, when this was prophesied, I think Agabus the prophet came, and then he said, you know, he tied Paul's hands, and then he says, it's so shall it be, you know, this person is going to, Paul is going to end up like this. All the brethren said, don't go, don't go. Paul, you know what's going to happen. This is a true prophetic word from the Lord do not go to Jerusalem and then he said why, why? He said, what means to break my heart so why do you break my heart he says I have to go why because there is no greater joy 
than to fulfill the will of God for our lives. No, even in the you know, even in all this as a veteran missionary pastor and all that, Paul was very clear the message to the Ephesian elders was finish the course. The will of God and his plan is unchanging. Right? We have to finish. It says, no need to finish my course with joy and the ministry which I receive of the Lord Jesus. Paul did not walk off midway, leaving the ministry that God has given to him incomplete. Now, it could be some of us here are having to make decisions about where we need to go, what we need to do, whatever. Notice his joy was that he will finish his course with joy and to finish the ministry that we have received. As pastor, what, what, is the, what would that be? The day that I can entrust this church, for instance, to a good man. Or it's in the hands, capable hands of a number of good men. Right, we finish our course with joy. We complete that ministry that we have received. It says, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So you see here, there is no contradiction in the scriptures. He preached what repentance toward God and the, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ is all about the salvation by the grace of God. Nowhere was it ever implied that repentance is a work. For righteousness but notice now here comes the, the heart of this take heed right we must take heed also that we maintain a clear conscience verse 25 now and now behold I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more Paul understands this is his one song. This is his final words to the elders at Ephesus. They are not going to see him alive anymore beyond this. He's never going to see them again. All right? The only time he's going to ever see them again will be on the other side of heaven. All right? He says, I... Because of that, look at verse 26. Wherefore... I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. He, in his parting words, he tells them, you know what? He has a clear conscience that as a minister of the gospel, his hands are clean. There is no blood on his hands. Why? He has not misled anyone into believing that they are saved by giving them a tempered or watered down gospel. All right? He has not uh, tempered with the word of God or shortchanged them. He's given them everything that was profitable to them. His conscience is clear. All right? No one is going to perish because of something that Paul had done. He cannot be blamed for that. Sometimes it's in the negative also because there are things that the preacher can do by way of his misconduct or his sin that can turn people from the faith. It can shipwreck other people. False teaching or error or careless teaching can shipwreck people. Some, because of things that the preacher has done, you know what, they may have left church and they've not, they're not going to be back in church for many years. As a young believer, I was not allowed to go to church, but when I was finally able to make that choice and decision for myself, right, because my father had actually forbidden me to go. The problem was that the church that I, the people that I knew had merged the church and then what happens, it was under a very, very eloquent preacher who was very abusive. 
For months as I sat there, I felt something was dying inside. About six months later, I couldn't take it anymore. Okay? And it was very cultic also because um, as much as the men were in the positions, holding position of office and leadership, uh, the preacher kept only the women close to him every Sunday. Every message was very heavy, abusive. Someone came in late, he spent the next 10 minutes ripping that person to pieces. And I wasn't looking for an emotional experience, but I felt so heavy that something was wrong. I stopped going. There was an open letter a few months later that called him to question because he had actually tricked the church. Okay, Now, remember, he, he's a brilliant preacher, very eloquent, memorized whole chunks of scripture. He had rearranged the scripture so that you can actually sing it. Written a whole bunch of books. Brilliant. Mine. But of very low character. Lied to the church. Tricked them into paying for his lover to fly from the UK all the way to Singapore to work as a housekeeper. The wife and children were begging for him to come home. The church was funding the sin of adultery. And finally he was exposed and called out, whatever, what, pastor, for a number of years, I, I was not able to bring myself to go to church. Of course, it's a, that's my excuse, right? I'm accountable for that choice. But the thing is this, how many others maybe have never gone back to church or have gone off the deep end as a result of this? Paul, by his exemplary conduct and his impeccable behavior and his, con- and his character, you know, he was f- pure from the blood of all men. His ministry was not tainted. Right? And not only that, it says the other thing was because of he took careful heed to declare the whole counsel of God. Verse 27 For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, all of it. Right? Not just the. Okay, now a lot of preachers have their favorite stuff that they like to harp on over and over and over again. Right? We call them hobby horses. Right? It's those toy wooden horse that you know kids will sit and then they rock and rock and rock right now some pastors will get onto their hobby horse and they preach about the same thing every message for about 10-15 minutes before they go back to the main thing now he says here I am not shunned he did not avoid he did not shy away from it to declare unto you what all the counsel of God not just the parts that are popular not just the parts that you and I like to hear but all of it whatever was needful alright because why, as I mentioned this morning Even as a parent, you want your children to feed on things even if they don't like it. What was that song, uh, that Ron Hamilton song that the kids were sing? I love broccoli, I love you. Why? Because imagine we had to write a song to encourage children to eat broccoli because they don't like to chew on the vegetables. But here was whatever was needful. It says all the counsel of God, right? It was important. We, we teach, preach everything, and we need to be concerned that we don't just talk about it, we put this into practice. Okay? So, I want to realize here that the, the, look at the things that he emphasizes on. The complete ministry of the Word of God. All right? Not just, well, here's our group of Baptist churches, and these are the specific doctrines that we specialize in, but we ignore the rest. To teach all, declare all the counsel of God. Now, sometimes it's difficult. As a pastor, I recognize it's difficult. It's difficult, uh, especially in Singapore. When we talk about the role of the wife and the role of the mother, all right, what happens in a country that is among the one of the most expensive cities in the world, where we have gone 
in within one to two generations, the assumption is this, there is no way a family can survive without two sources of income. Both husband and wife must work. But which comes first? The counsel or scripture? God's plan and design for the family and the home and the marriage? Or society? Right? Or what is the norm in society? Or what are the financial demands and needs? It's not easy. No pastor wants to preach that in my country. You know why? Simple mathematics. If we were to preach that, that the wife's first ministry is to her husband, and then the second ministry is to her children, right? and the scripture says that she is to be a keeper at home, 50% of the offering will disappear if everyone were to obey. Is that right? Assuming that men and women, it's, you know, the husband's wife, that's 50%, half the offering will disappear. Now, we were faced with that kind of challenge and difficulty before. I, I told the members, I said, look, it does not change the fact that this, if this is in the scriptures, we teach it, we do not shun to declare it, God will have to find another way but we can hold him to that promise because right, we are obeying what he has to say. Amen. Okay? Now, as if we have a difficulty and a problem, now, we, can, we have every right to ask, Lord, you have to show us a way forward. You will give us a breakthrough. Right? You solve the problem for us, but we are not going to try to work around this. What you say, we obey. Period. Right? So we do not shun to declare all the counsel of God. We do not shun to obey all the counsel of God. Even the parts when it is inconvenient. Now, what happened in my country is now happening to the Philippines. Right? It's now, it's gradually, it's becoming an accepted assumption that both husband and wife need to be at work. Oh, worse, actually, it's... And because beginning with the pastor, now this is, the example is not laid down. What happens? Today, the way it operates is that the, the, the pastor sends his wife to work so that for the sake of the ministry, okay, we can meet those needs and then we can actually get the ministry done. How? You send the wife to work. Okay? Now, how that translates over in my country sometimes is that the wife is the one always on the business trip. It's not because, uh, you know, un has, makes more trips overseas than the husband uh, than the, who is the pastor because, right, the pastor may have some mission trips and preach overseas at conferences or whatever, but the wife makes more business trips. Why? Because of work. Now, it's not popular to preach this. It's out of season. But the Word of God is the Word of God. Okay? Now, he did not shun, all right? But then he also tells them to take heed. All right? Verse 8 to their calling. Take heed also to, in fact, there were a number of things that you actually had to take heed in this, in this verse. All right? So just. We're going to park ourselves in verse 28 for a while and look at what it says. Take heed, therefore. What's the first thing? Unto yourselves. What did he tell the elders at Ephesus? All right? Told the pastors, guard yourself. Nothing has changed in the last 2,000 years. The first thing and one of the requirements here for the man of God, and you'll find this in uh, tight, I think it was, I can't remember was it in 1 Timothy chapter 3 or Titus chapter 1, was that you, the man, the pastor needs to be a vigilant man. Not just guarding and watching over others, the first person we need to watch over is ourselves. Take heed unto yourselves. And then it says, and to all the flock. Shepherds, by their profession, don't get a lot of sleep. 
If you go to Genesis, you'll find Jacob complained to his father-in-law Laban how that you know his eyes they were robbed of sleep so many times. All right, it says here the to yourselves and to all the flock. Oh, but I don't like to characterize my ministry such that we are always contending, we're always fighting, we're always on guard. You know, we just like to enjoy ourselves when we come together in fellowship. We just want to come and love the Lord. And we, Look, there is no room for a careless man as the pastor. If he is a careless person, if he is not watchful over the smallest things, he should quit. Okay, now I'm not saying that, this is not saying that he should be a person that will micromanage everything. The job of managing every little detail, whatever, that's up to the Holy Spirit of God. But here we're talking about being careful and watchful. And can I say this as a pastor? One of the most heartbreaking things for me as a pastor has always been to warn about what was going to happen and then to see the members ignore the warnings and then get into trouble. And then they'll come back and blame me for it. Okay, that part, I don't bother. They blame me, I don't bother because I had already warned. In fact, it, my words would be a witness against them. But the thing that personally frustrates me and discourages me is the fact that I saw it was going to happen, I knew it was going to happen, I warned and nobody cared. It happened anyway. Parents, have you been there? You warn your kids. All right, don't do this, don't try that, whatever. Boom, something happens. Then someone's in hospital, whatever. And you know, there is no joy in saying, I told you so. Seriously, there's no joy in that. It's too late. But here it says, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock. Why? Over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers. Right? To feed the church of God. Take heed. Right? Here it says, the, over, the Holy Spirit of God. This is a holy calling from God Himself. All right? It's the Holy Spirit of God who had made them the overseers. The overseers are those that watch over. Right? They, 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 they oversee the work, which means that there are other laborers, other workers, but there is a supervisory role. All right? The overseers. And then it says to feed. The idea of feeding here is basically to shepherd. To two of the three hats that the pastor has to wear. All right? One as overseer, from where you get the, uh, the, the word bishop, episcopos. And then the second one was to feed, to care for the church of God. Okay? You can't care for the church of God if you are exploiting the church of God. Fleecing them feeding of them, scamming them. Today, it's not just monetary anymore. There's, I'm so sick and tired of seeing news after news, scandal after scandal of sexual predators among independent Baptist churches. We're preying on the sheep. And these are sexual predators. Here it says, take heed. The warning was an individual one. It says, every one of you, that you, Paul confronted the pastor, said, you watch yourself, you guard yourself. Why? Because there is a holy calling and God that made you overseers. Make sure you feed, you care for the church of God. All right? Make sure you oversee and you supervise what is going on. All right? Make sure you are careful and you watch that you know, there are, there's no danger or whatever. And keep warning. Don't shun to declare all the counsel of God. Why? Because she is precious. Amen. Note this, which he had purchased with his own blood. Why do I say it's precious? You see, the value of something is measured by the price that is paid. Amen. Right? Oh, we see this expensive car outside, this Ferrari, 
his Lamborghini, it's half a million dollars. Wow, amazing. All right? Com compared it to the tuk-tuk that's outside. Here, this was purchased with the what? Precious blood of the Lamb. Okay? The church of God, you notice this verse, uh, I never forget this because, uh, why? Uh, we were actually dealing with someone one time who believed in the early, I think, second or third century heresy. And they denied the divinity of Christ. Okay? This man was part of a, a group, actually. Interesting, that there is a cult which also split. <laughs> they also had this split. They didn't, weren't talking to each other. Okay? But they believed that you know, the person that died at the cross was a man. That's why he says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He said, the God spirit left Jesus. Uh, only a man died there. But you know what? This, when I asked around, I asked a preacher, he pointed this verse to me. He says, you know what? The church of God, which God had purchased with his own blood. It was God that paid for the church with his own blood. I never forgot that verse. You know why? In attempting to find the answer, once I found it, even though my memory is not very good, I never forgot this. You want to grow? You want to learn? You want to be able to be of a help to others? You know what? Learn to handle questions and give, them ans give people answers. As you teach that over and over again, there are some things you will never forget for the rest of your life. Okay? It's not a special calling or ministry. You know, everyone ought to be able to teach somebody else. Here it says God had purchased this church with his own blood. Now, if God had purchased this church with his own blood, understand this that as, as a pastor or a minister or whatever, this church is not for me to do as I wish. Because why? It does not belong to me, it belongs to him. It belongs to him. I'm only a caretaker. I will have to give account to answer for what I did to his bride. Did I defile the bride? Or did I take good care of her? You see, sometimes pastors forget when they think that the church is their, their bride. They neglect their wives also in the process. The ministry comes first, Right? So that gives me license to neglect my wife. No, your bride is the one you were married to. But this is Christ's bride. He purchased her with his own blood. But because it's entrusted into our care, you better take good care of her. All right? Understand this. That affects, as a member, affects my view of this church. If this is a church that was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, then do I value it as such or do I think, ah, you know, I don't think much of this church. It's nothing. It ought to be precious. Everyone purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ ought to be precious to me if I've been purchased by His blood. Now, this was the internal warning, right? That to the pastors, to the men, all that, it says uh, to take heed, right? As because why they are overseers. But then notice this. The second verse. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, notice, he says it will enter in among you. So where is the danger? Inside the church. Alright? Now, what happens elsewhere in Matthew 7? The Lord Jesus Christ warned about wolves in sheep's clothing. In other words, they are wearing a mask. Right? They look like sheep, but inwardly, Jesus said they are ravening wolves. Okay? Can you imagine the appetite of a ravening wolf? He's not going to stop at one victim. There are going to be many others. Of insatiable appetite. It says here, they'll enter in among them, which tells me the danger that Paul warned about was this, the carelessness in allowing members to come, the type of members that come into the church. Are they sheep? 
or are they really wolves? Okay, now, can I say this, that we are, many of our churches are already in trouble because we have fallen for the lie, all right? And we accepted that, that it cannot be questioned, that, um, I don't even know what time, okay, never mind. We have accepted without question, okay, that anyone who claims that they are saved, who make a profession of faith, we must accept as a member without question at all. Here, this would, if that was true, Paul would not have to give a warning here that there are grievous wolves who are going to enter in among them. And what was the risk here? The danger was that they will not spare the flock. In other words, they will feed on the flock and destroy them without mercy. No mercy at all. And one of the dangers in real life, okay, uh, when wolves come in among sheep is this. Sheep are usually so dumb in our eyes, they stand there and they will watch as the wolves tear into the other sheep. And all they do is they watch. They don't run. Okay, I don't know. These days, I guess everyone takes out their phone, they, they catch a video, and then they upload it. And here, the role of watching and guarding was given to the overseer. All right, the overseer, all right, to the shepherds who feed the, the church of God. Oh, but pastor, you know, uh, if anybody wants to come, we know we, it's okay, we just add them in. After all, our numbers are bigger, the offering will be healthier, we have more budget, we can get more things done. What does it matter? It matters because the scriptures are very clear that the membership of a New Testament church consained, consists of the assembly of the saints, those who have been set apart by God. How? When they got saved. Okay? I'll just make a very quick detour here. All right, to 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. All right, Paul tells us, don't you know? All right, you are the temple of God, referring to, he says ye, referring to what? The members of the church, ye, all of you. All right, are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now notice the next verse, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. He says to the members of the church, you are holy. All right, you, this is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God. This place is holy. Do not allow anyone to defile this temple. Amen. Now, there, this is also a very strong argument for the purity of the membership of the church. Not just in moral conduct, however, but the fact is that the, only the saints should be allowed to be joined. Because if we're not careful, what happens? Going back to Acts chapter 20, we eventually, in that carelessness, allow even the wolves to come in. That's why I say there is no room in the pastorate, in the pastoral leadership, for a man who is careless, who is not vigilant. Oh, but you see, now personally, I don't like to be suspicious of everybody. I don't do that. But it is my job to verify. Oh, what is the scriptural basis? Well, what did First Thessalonians chapter 5 say? Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Prove. Test. Oh, wait a minute. It's not just given to the pastors. It's given to everyone. It's my job. It's our job to test. But you see, in the politically, incor politically correct culture today, Many of us have been, our hands are tied. All right, we have been silenced. 
Because we are not allowed to do verification. Can I say this? This has allowed the door to be open to the wolves who come in who do not spare the flock. That's why we are in the mess that we are in today. When you study the history of the churches and, and you study also in the Trail of Blood, you'll see that this already happened in the early centuries when the state churches gradually lowered the requirements for membership to anybody can, you know, especially if you're just baptized as an infant or whatever, you can become a member. It's, it's a matter of time before the church is entirely filled with only the unconverted, only the natural men, only the lost. Okay? Now, there is not just an internal danger, there is also an external danger. All right? Now, firstly, the external danger was in verse 29, sorry. All right? The wolves from the outside come in. Okay? But as I mentioned, they don't come in with the big t shirt and advertisement that says, I am a wolf. And behind you have the thing here, it says, Wolf number seven. And that one says, Number nine. All right, here it says Team Wolf. No, they don't come in like that. All right, they wear the disguise. They don't come in and say, okay, I am of the devil. I'm of my father, the devil. And the, you know, the last of my, the devil, he, I would do also. No, he, he don't do that. The danger becomes just like Judas. What you have, remember Jesus said, one of you is a devil. Is that, they come in the form of sometimes the, as far as the eyes are concerned, as far as our senses are concerned, outwardly they're the most trusted people. But inwardly, never having experienced or received the grace of God onto salvation. Now, verse 30, there was another warning. All right, because it says here, also of your own selves shall men arise. He's saying, among yourselves here, okay? Paul is saying, I'm talking about you guys, right? The elders at Ephesus, he says, of your own selves shall men arise. How? Say, speaking perverse things. Notice, to draw away disciples after them. Why? Because it's going away from making disciples of Jesus Christ, the goal becomes that these men move away to a man-centered ministry where now these are, they're going to draw a following that men will follow them rather than to follow Christ. Okay, now, I'm pointing this out. I'm kind of taking my time slowly pointing this out. Why? Because you must see these are the identifying marks of things that we must beware of. Okay, not to be watchful, not just in our church here, but to see what is happening around us. You see, we don't want a, what we want to have are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, right, trained by Pastor Joel Maklangawa, not disciples of Maklangawa. You get what I'm saying here? Why? Because the, as a New Testament church, this is not Pastor Joel's fan club. Okay, and you must pay subscription to join the fan club, by the way. Okay, but you get a free t-shirt. Actually, you paid the subscription. Right? Never mind. Okay, so the, the point is, it is not about men. But we see the rise of many very man-centered things. Okay, yes, people used to say, what would Jesus do? Now these days, what would pastor so-and-so do? What would brother so-and-so say? Okay, this warning, in other words, so there is, an inter, there is an external danger, but there is also an internal one. The temptation to move towards a man-centered type of ministry rather than the, a Christ-centered one. Jesus said this in Matthew 7 verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. 
Now ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Wait, the, well, how do you know? Verse 16 points out that there, you look at the fruits. You examine the, the fruits. You know, there will be evidence to show what kind of, what kind of people they are. Oddly today, among our independent Baptists, or people will preach a whole sermon and rant and rave about, oh, we don't want to be fruit inspectors. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. For some, there are characteristic fruits of certain ministries. Money scandals, sex scandals. Sometimes to the point the graduates of the Bible college perpetuate the same thing. And I'm not talking about non-Baptists. This is in our ranks. They're characteristic because uh, it goes back sometimes to the so-called founder themselves. It says what? Beware. All right? Now, here the danger is it requires very careful discernment because there is a disguise. Sheep's clothing. Right? But inwardly, it says they are ravening wolves. So it requires discernment. Okay, they're going to come in the disguise. Now, I do believe that the Lord gives a special enablement to the pastor to be able to discern certain things. And can I say this from very painful personal experience that many times the wolves, these wolves, only let down their disguise, right? before the pastor but the other members don't get to see that they see the disguise in other words if you go purely by your experience but brother so and so sister so and so oh, but they're okay my experience with them yes that's what you were allowed to see but understand this that when the pa your pastor gives a warning it's because he saw something that you did not see and he saw something that he previously did not see You, you see what I'm saying here? Because there is a disguise and until the mask comes off, they will come across as sheep. This requires again discernment and wisdom. Alright? But inwardly it says they are ravening wolves. Wolves seek to destroy and that's why they are dangerous. Alright? John 10 verse 10 the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. In contrast, the Lord Jesus Christ said this, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. What's the difference is, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, you notice, he who is in it just for the money, is just a job. This church is just a platform, a springboard for me to go to a bigger ministry or church. It's just a stepping stone. He there is a hireling and not the shepherd whose own sheep are seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. He's not gonna stick his he's not gonna stick out his neck for you. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Right? The wolves come in, they destroy the flock, the sheep scatter, they run. But it says the hireling fleeth. Why? Because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. Now, one thing I've learned over the last few years is this. The shepherd, his job is to stand, it's not to run. He will have to face down these wolves. And very often for the shepherd, he is outnumbered. It's a tough job, he's outnumbered. Very few will ever understand what the pastor has to face. I have learned the hard way that very few pastors understand what it's like to fend off the wolves. 
Imagine my surprise when I spoke to those who had been in the ministry 20 years longer than me, and then they said, hey, oh, brother, I wish I could help you. I said, I've never been in that situa- kind of situation ever. Thanks. But understand this, that the Lord stands with us. All right? But it is a lonely job. It's not to, he's not to run away, he's to fend off, not to run from them. The hirelings will run from them. Why? Because, well, there's problems, whoever. I can always resign and find another church. That's why sometimes I don't take, things, uh, don't take some of this seriously when someone says, oh, I've got 25 years in the ministry. Well, it depends on what you mean by 25 years. Is it one, two years of experience multiplied 12 times, repeated 12 times, or is it 25 years in one place? Because why? You will see some are serial hoppers, just like there are serial job hoppers. There are those that go from place to place. Why? Because well, the hiring sees the problem, sees danger, wherever they run, they move on. When things get tough, they resign. Right? And, and I, I had to find out the hard way that wolves can smell the weakness in the church they smell the blood you're wounded you're bleeding they move in for the kill they see the opportunity okay and wolves by the way when you study wolves you're going to learn something interesting about them they do not we use the phrase lone wolf a lot but the truth is wolves work as a pack they work as a team okay and when the wolves attack as a team they are coordinated to wear a bigger prey down your size is not a protection they will wear you down right until the victim is too tired exhausted and then they will finish him off they outnumber the victim. That's why wolves have been successful in hunting, even though the prey can be so much larger. Even though the prey, with one kick, they could kill the wolf. Okay? They work as teams. They chase you down. One problem, it wears you down. Then the second problem comes. We wear, exhaust you further. And then the third problem comes. And until finally, you have no strength and no energy left. The wolves work that way. Now, some years ago, I, in, in learning and, and studying about sheep, I came across a, st- a study, and a, it was a book by a pastor who did a very deep study of sheep. He said, yes, sheep and goats, there's something interesting about them because they are different. Uh, their character, their nature is different, and then what they eat is different. Okay, Sheep, that's why they need a shepherd to guide them to where to feed, because why? Sheep, if they eat anything they can get sick very easily. They must feed on the right stuff. That needs a shepherd to guide them to where to feed. And they're very picky, which is a good thing. Why? It describes how discerning the New, the New Testament saint is. That the saved believer is very picky and, and very selective about what we take. We prove all things. Goats, on the other hand, will eat anything Okay. Now, but one of the things that was that stood out in that study was this: that the pastor also talked about that not all goat, uh, not all sheep are passive. Okay, so there are certain sheep, the rams. They stand at the edges to guard the flock also. And where the danger comes, the rams go to action. I like that picture, you know why? It tells me that where there is danger, there are other men who stand up along with the pastor and they fend off the wolves. You know, every church needs some rams. There are not many, but they they, they have to be there. They're bold, they're strong, And they care for the flock. You know, 
Paul wrote all these things, all right, to point out to everyone that the church that was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ is worth protecting, is worth watching over, all right, and it is worth guarding. But what about you? Hmm? What about you and I? Is this, do we believe that? Okay, because there is a grave danger that faces us today. Now, how many minutes are we in? How many minutes are we? Because my, okay. I just um, look, let's look at one more passage here. First, Second Peter chapter two, verse one to three. Okay, I want to point out here: wolves seek to make merchandise of God's people. Now remember, Jesus warned in Matthew seven about the wolves in sheep's clothing, all right, and that, that these were false prophets. Now look at Second Peter chapter two, verse one to three. But there were false prophets also among the people. You notice that among the people. So what happened? They had one way or another, the walls that guard the New Testament church and the door of entry had been compromised. And so we had to guard the door of membership and baptism through baptism. Right? Here there were false prophets among the people. It says, even as there shall be false prophets among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Notice, Privately, privately, secretly, you bring in damnable heresies. Again, they snuck this in through the back door. Ninja doctrines. Slowly, over the course of time, however, sometimes gradually so that we don't notice it. All right, it says, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, the danger is this, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken. Now, whoa, do you see that? The way of truth shall be evil spoken. You know, the thing about contending with the faith sometimes is that they, we bring the way of truth and there are those who will attack it. They will attack us, they will attack this also. And many will follow their pernicious ways instead of the way of truth. All right. Now, a lot of these things are prophetic, you know, because look, look, look at verse 3. And through covetousness, all right, greed, a desire to have what God did not allow us to have. Okay, talking about what? The ones in, in the, behind the pulpit. So, shall they with feigned words, right, fake words, with uh, pretense, make merchandise of you? The word merchandise comes from the Greek word, okay, where which in the English language we get the word emporium, departmental store. To a place to buy, sell, and trade. Turning the church into a marketplace, into a, a place of profit. All right? You know, I, I know missionaries that have unfriended me on Facebook. They keep my members, our members, as their friends, but not me. Because after that, they, they, I, I know because the, some of the members will tell me, Pastor, you know, there's this missionary or the, this preacher or whatever, and they have a prayer request that they need X and X number of dollars, you know, whatever. I said, oh yeah, I know, I know that kind of prayer request. Okay, and it's done without the pastor's knowledge because he was unfriended. Okay, so simple tip here: check if your pastor is has been unfriended by someone, and they, as a preacher, they have you on their list. You know, you 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 need to ask yourself why. You really have to ask yourself why. Here, this uses the members as a, their market to sell stuff to, to buy and sell, whatever. All right. Uh, I did a test one time. 
we noticed something wrong about this missionary because we noticed that there were mention, all mention of our church, even though they came by our church and visited and, and all that, was erased. I was like, hmm. So I, I told one of the men, say, hey, okay, do a test here. All right? We just tagged him. We said some picture. Oh, great to have you here. Whatever. whatever. Next thing, pff, all gone. Next thing, uh, a few of us were actually blocked. A few months later, the, the Facebook page has re-emerged, but it was cleaned up. Whoa, what's going on here? Okay. One of the men, I, I told him, you know why the, the I said, I, 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 said I, I feel sorry for you. I'm, I'm sorry this keeps happening to you because why he keeps getting this kind of request. I said, brother, Somehow, to these guys, you have a very prosperous looking face. They think that you are a very prosperous businessman and you have money. Okay, and it was a very consistent thing because over and over again it happened, even though he's not rich. But I said, somehow, you've been blessed with that face, you look rich. <laughs> All right, but here, what happens is this. Since they, they with faint words, Right, using the words, however, to work on the people, on the members, they said to me, make merchandise of them. Okay, for financial profit. This is whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Now there will be the time of proper judgment and damnation. But sadly, today in the ministry, it has become a marketplace. How? Sometimes, the, like I said, the clever use of prayer requests, especially when it's on Facebook. Okay? Um, prayer letters. One example was a bunch of preachers visited a place, they took pictures, and they left every photo, deliberately left the missionary out of the picture. To make it look like that was their ministry. Right? And some preachers have been banned from certain churches because why? They've been caught going there, taking pictures while they're here to pass this off as their ministry. They've been permanently banned from some of these places. Alright? Um, new converts show up years later after they have left the work. But no one can verify, right? So they're there, they're in the picture. And realize this, there, there is a lot, all sorts of danger here that we need to get, we have to be aware of. Now, so, now, let's wrap this up. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember. Do you see that? He tells the elders, watch and remember. All the words that Paul had just told them. Don't forget what I said. It says that by the space of three years, in the three years that Paul was at Ephesus, what did he do? I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Why tears? Because he cares for them. He loves them. Right? He doesn't want them to come to harm or to be you know, uh, taken advantage of by all these wolves. Right? He warns constantly. It's not a one-time thing. It's good that we can have a conference once a year to deal with things like that. But Paul did this night and day. Amen. Night and day. But our church culture today will not allow that. It's like, oh, pastor, why you keep harping on the same thing over and over and over again? You know, it's getting a bit tiresome here. Why can't we hear some more soft, nice, fluffy, you know, positive only things, whoever, you know, oh, how I love Jesus. You know, let's, let's be effeminate. How can you be kicking back when there is a clear and present danger just right at the door? 
Oh, pastor, you're being paranoid. Really? Then why did Paul leave this warning? Did he have a mental illness? Because it's night and day. He warned with tears. He pleaded with them. Why? Because not everyone's going to believe him. Not everyone's going to take this seriously. And he's pleading with them with tears. Now, so he says, okay, so what is our defense? Now, bread, now, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Right? Look, this is his church. He purchased her with his own blood. He can preserve and uphold everything. Right? He can protect us. But his, secondly, the, to his, the word of his grace. The word of God. Is our protection how which is able to build you up all right and to give you an inheritance among all them that which are sanctified so we see here that all who are sanctified not that will give us an inheritance and then we have to guard ourselves take heed that we not lose our rewards okay but here the word of his grace is able to build us up now when it builds us up it strengthens us when it strengthens us we can fend off Okay, I appreciate the fact that uh, Jong has been what? You've been going through Nehemiah? And that's a very important study. We took a, about one year to deal with this last year. The whole book of Nehemiah. Why? Because the walls were very important. And the people were in distress. And until the walls could come up, they were constantly under the risk the danger of attack, nobody could relax. They were in a constant state of anxiety until the walls and the gates were in place. Because without that, nobody could sleep well. Okay? The sheep can only safely graze when the pastor or the shepherd is vigilant and watching nearby. But if the, past, if the shepherd rests, the sheep are in danger. That's why you need to pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastors because why? It's not easy. And in a time of danger, what I've experienced was this. In the last three years, I have been on guard, very watchful. It has affected my body. It's only during this time that I now had a blood pressure problem that had to be dealt with with medication to get it to be normal. The, it became more difficult to go to sleep. Why? Because there are a lot of things. You're on a high alert. Moms, you know what I'm talking about when you don't know when the baby is going to wake up and cry. Constantly on alert that I had to be on certain medic very strong medication to help me to go to sleep. But once I'm asleep, I'm okay. I can wake up, have a full night. But going to sleep, was that, the thing was, being on the alert, you cannot switch off. I cannot, I've not been able to switch off for a while, for a number of months now, from being pastor to being just a husband or a father or a fellow brother in Christ. Why? One high alert. And it will eat away at the physical health and mind and the peace of mind of the pastor. Alright? The other men, you understand what I'm talking about. If you've been on guard also, you know. But here, notice that the word notice of his grace we need the grace of God how do we find this it's going to be seeking it in the word of God the help that we need to fend off against wolves right to deal with all this and he so as he ended with this he, he said Lord, he commends them to God and then to the word of his grace and this has to be the foundation 
that we get back to this and build this up, how do we, how do we discern, how do we see, how do we detect the wolves? Right? How do we detect the men who will rise up from among us to draw disciples away after them? The test is here. We have to be discerning. Right? We have to be watchful, we have to be careful. Every one of those things runs contrary, opposite to the prevailing church and ministry culture that we have today. All right? Do not accept anyone, okay, as a, as a pastor or preacher or whatever, who, if they are not careful men. This is one of the minimum that we ought to expect of the shepherds. Okay? I'm not saying they have to be people who have OCD. But they have to be careful, diligent people. Okay? Who verify, who prove all things, who check everything out based on what? The standard of God's word, not based on their opinion. All right? And we, as you see here, Paul was desiring that, you know what, the, this will be, the, the church at Ephesus will be a church that will build up others, train others who will surpass him, right? And that, that as a church, that church was precious because of the price that was paid, the blood of Jesus Christ. God purchased that church with his own blood. You will notice something. You go to any museum in Cambodia, everything that is precious is very well guarded. Isn't that right? They don't just leave it lying on the floor, some treasure or some painting or, or piece of art. Right? They don't just leave it lying around. It's very well guarded, right? Maybe beautiful, it's put on display, but it's also very well guarded and protected. Then why do we see that this church, purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, is not worth protecting? Doesn't she deserve the best that we can do? Right? This is not just something for the men, also for the ladies. You know, are you careful? Because we can allow a softness to come in simply because we allow the emotional sentimentality to take over instead of demanding biblical spirituality. There is a difference. Right? I pray that you and I will know the difference and then continue to exercise that. Right? The discernment and the biblical discrimination to be able to tell the difference between the real and the fake, the wolf versus the sheep. Right? Because it is worth it. Right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these thoughts